Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. This is Shepherd's Review and in this video we're going to talk about fluid and electrolytes and we're also going to talk about fluid imbalances, particularly hypovolemia and hypervolemia. So what we're going to talk about is the normal functions of fluid, just a simple review of it, and we're going to talk about the causes, the treatments, uh, and the labs to look out for for hypovolemia and hypervolemia. For more videos and updates, please like and subscribe to our channel. It'll help with the YouTube algorithm. It'll also help us out a lot, and uh, let's get started with the lecture. So fluids. Fluids are composed of two things. It's composed of the intracellular fluid, and it's also composed of the extracellular fluid. Now, intracellular fluid, meaning anything that's inside the cells is considered intracellular fluid. Extracellular fluid, meaning anything that's outside the cells is considered extracellular. So for example, here I have three circles, and let's pretend these three circles are cells. And basically, anything that's inside these cells is considered intracellular fluids. Extracellular means anything that's outside of these cells is considered extracellular fluids. So let's talk about a little bit more details of extracellular fluids. The extracellular fluid is a bit more complicated than intracellular fluids. The extracellular is composed of three, three compartments. It's composed of the intravascular space. It's also composed of the intercellular space and also the transcellular space. Now, intravascular and intercellular are composed of 97% of the ECF, extracellular fluids. Transcellular fluid, is, it's only composed of 2.5% of the extracellular fluids. Now, let's talk about a little bit more details of each of them individually. So, Intravascular is also known as blood plasma. It's also known as a blood vessel. Basically, um, intravascular is any solid that's inside the blood vessel is considered intravascular. This could be part of the, the, the chambers of the arteries of the hearts. And basically, let me just draw it real quick for you guys. So here we have a blood vessels. Could be in any parts of the body. Any a mineral or solvent that's inside of these uh, blood vessels is considered intravascular. Intercidal space is anything that's within the capillaries of the blood vessels or with, um, with, within the cells is considered intercidal space. So for example, here I have cells and then here I have the blood vessels. So basically, Intercellular space is the space that is within the cells and uh, between and within also the capillaries of the blood vessels. So this space right here is called the intercellular space. Now the intercellular space that contain uh, water solvents such as sugar. Uh, they also consist of salt, fatty acids and certain coenzyme. They also consist of minerals such as sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarbonate. Transcellular, are, transcellular is any mineral solvent that's in body compartments. Transcellular is also known as the third space. So when I say transcellular, there are minerals or solvent that's in body compartments such as the lymph, the lymphoids, Parts in, uh, also in the cerebrospinal fluid. It can also be in the GI lumen. And also it can be found in the intraocular space. So these are basically each individually the composed of the extracellular fluid. Now the intravascular fluid and the inter intercellular space, I'm sorry, the intravascular space and the intercidal space, they actually play a, a, an important role of exchanging and exchanging minerals and solvents. They actually communicate with each other. Let me show you a little bit more details in the next slide. So here we have the plasma. Remember, plasma is also known as the intravascular space. So the intravascular space, which is right here, and the intercidal space, which is right here, they actually communicate. So here we have the intracellular fluid, the intercellular space, 
in the intravascular space. The reason why they're able to exchange and exchange solvents, minerals and solvents, is because in, uh, in the blood vessels, they have some small capillaries in between them. And these small capillaries are able to exchange and exchange minerals and solvents. So this space right here is able to have sodium go in and out, potassium go in and out. But however, there are certain minerals and solvents that won't be able to leak out from the intravascular space into interstitial space, and that is one of them is called the RVC. Now RVC is a bit too big, and they won't be able to fit into the cap small capillaries into the interstitial space. Now the intercellular fluid, they won't be able to communicate between the interstitial spaces because they have some uh, fat deposits, a protection layer that when the intercidal space tries to enter in, it just bounces right back off. But between the intercidal space and the intervascular space, these small capillaries, they're able to come inside and also able to exchange outside the intercidal space. The reason why this is so significant is because when you do a blood draw on a patient and you're trying to look for their electrolyte balances through a blood draw, basically, the concentration that you'll see in the intervascular space is it'll be a reflection of what you see in the intercidal space. So what you see in the intravascular space will reflect what you see in the interstitial space, which is why you're able to determine their electrolyte imbalances through a blood draw. Now let's talk about, uh, that was just a simple review of fluids and the significance of the blood draw. Let's talk about the fluid imbalances, particularly hypovolemia and hypervolemia. Now let's first start out with hypovolemia. The causes of hypovolemia could be either from blood or fluid loss. Some causes include vomiting, this could be either be fluids or blood, excess sweating, diarrhea, fluid or blood, burns, diuretic use, high fever or shock. The symptoms for hypovolemia you'll see that their weight will decrease. Now this weight is not because of fats but because they're losing fluids. Their blood pressure will decrease is because the less fluids you have, meaning the less pressure. Cerebral venous pressure will decrease because there's less fluid. However, the respiration and the heart rate will go up because you see the heart, due to the heart, due to the body is detecting that there's less fluid and less blood, the heart will compensate by pumping more blood so that it can take blood from the arteries and it can go to the organs. However, when there's fluid loss, it'll continue to pump. It will continue to pump harder to compensate, which is why you'll see their respiration and their heart rate will increase. Their body is trying to compensate. Uh, now, the heart rate here, the heart rate will be weak and thready, though. That's very important. That is an NCLEX alert. The heart rate will go up and it will be weak and thready. Your output will decrease either because it's trying to hold fluid because it's losing so much fluid, or because you have no fluid at all. And the pulse pressure is narrow. This is also an important symptom to know. Uh, yeah, Pulse pressure will be narrow. Now let's look into uh, hypervolemia. Hypervolemia, the causes are congestive heart failure. This is because the heart is failing, so it's either left side or right side of heart failure is causing fluid overload. Liver failure, kidney failure, and fluid shifting, they're basically very similar. Uh, but the reason why it's causing uh, liver failure is because patients with liver failure, specifically if they're an alcoholic, they'll develop liver cirrhosis. Their liver is, very, is an important role on producing albumin. Now, albumin is a protein that holds fluids in place in the intravascular space, but when the liver is scarred and damaged, that means they won't produce any albumin. And due to that, there'll be fluid leakage from the intravascular space into the interstitial space. So that's why when you see patients with liver cirrhosis, you notice that their abdomen is big and distended because it's full of fluid. That's because of, of the albumin. They're not producing albumin, so there's leakage. And that can cause fluid overload. Kidney failure is the same thing. It's responsible for the fluid, main, uh, fluid homeostasis. Fluid shifting is basically um, the shifting of the intravascular space to um, the intercellular space. It's the same thing. So these can cause hypervolemia. Let me uh, erase this real quick.
So the signs of sentence you'll see here is that their weight will increase because of fluids. Their blood pressure will increase because the more fluids you have, the more pressure you have. Now the heart rate and the respiration rate will also go up. Please don't get it confused between hypovolemia because hypovolemia it's the same thing. But this heart rate will increase, but it'll be a bounding pulse. A bounding pulse. The cerebral view pressure will also increase, and also please remember this one too. This is important, as the pulse pressure will be wide. So usually, um, in exams, if you're in nursing school and if you're in an exam, or if you're taking practice questions, um, some questions they'll like to trick you between hypovolemia and hypervolemia concerning the signs and symptoms of the respiration and the heart rate, and also the pulse pressure. Remember that in hypovolemia, the pulse, the heart rate is up, but it's weak and thready. In hypervolemia, it's also up, but the pulse is bounding. The pulse pressure in hypovolemia is narrow. The pulse pressure in hypervolemia is wide. So I have here to be able to remember uh, a monomics so people to remember the difference between the heart rate. Which one? Which one um, uh, is a difference? So here, let's re let's let's say that the middle finger is the heart rate and the ring finger is the respiration. This is hypovolemia, okay? Uh, bas basically, it's uh, the middle finger and the ring finger is up. Heart rate is up. Respiration rate is up. And then the pulse pressure, look at the distance between the finger, it's narrow. So therefore, the pulse pressure is narrow. And remember, if the, pulse, if the heart rate is up for hypovolemia, the pulse pressure, the heart rate is weak and thready. Hypo is down. Hypo, heart rate is up, but the pulse pressure is weak and thready. Res uh, hypervolemia, it's, we can call it rock on. Um, and in, in this case, in hypervolemia, now the heart rate will, will be the index finger and the respiration rate will be the pinky finger. It's basically the opposite of hypovolemia, okay? So hypervolemia, heart rate is up, respiration is up, and look at the distance between the finger. It's wide. Therefore, the pulse pressure is wide. And also remember, heart rate will be a bounding pulse. Now the treatments in the lab. So the treatment for hypovolemia we would give them IV fluids. Now the IV fluids that we'll give is isotonic. Now in a further video we'll talk about the we'll talk individually details between the difference between isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. We'll also do weight them daily and we'll monitor INO. Now the treatments for hypervolemia will restrict fluids, especially with patients with liver cirrhosis, we would usually restrict them to 1500 ml per day. We would also weigh daily and monitor INO. I mean, the, the labs that we'll look for for hypovolemia, you'll notice that they'll have an increased serum osmolality. You'll see an increase urine specific gravity. You'll also see an increase of hematocrits, increased so increased sodium level, and also an increased BUN. For hypervolemia, 
It's basically the same thing of the of the hypovolemia, but everything is just down. So that's it for today's lecture. I uh, hope this helped. Uh, again, please, guys, like and subscribe for our channel for more for further videos. And uh, thank you so much.